different uh, from usual technical talks because I won't focus on the implementation of the recommenders, but some of the ethical concerns we have as a company uh, about applying technology to to serve the audience. Yes. So, first of all, I know there is a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian here. Um, I just wanted to thank for the opportunity to be here with you, to thank you all for having waken up early on a Sunday and following the, this maze into the universe to so you could be here. Um, that's really valuable to me and it's a real pleasure to be here sharing a beat and I would love to learn with you as well. So thank you. Um, a bit about me. So as I said, I'm Brazilian. Um, I've been living in London uh, for five years now. I recently got the indefinite to remain there, which is quite ironic now that the UK is trying to get out of Europe and I always thought that was a brilliant thing. But anyway, life is strange. I'm a senior data engineer at the BBC. I graduated as a computer engineer. Um, so based on my graduation, I would even be allowed to build small houses back in Brazil. Uh, but I really focused on applying to computers, particularly software. So I've been developing software for 16 years now professionally, um, both for public in, and the private sector. Initially, my career, I worked for the Brazilian Ministry of Science and Technology, where we would build this um, application to help uh, hospitals and doctors to plan surgeries. So it allows building three-dimensional images and offering tools for processing those images and segmenting and selecting bones and, and other uh, parts of the body. Um, over time, I moved to media, building recommendation engines. I worked with education for a while. So uh, I just love uh, to work. Um, I love open source. Uh, how many, first question, uh, who here uh, is this? Are you all students or are there people who already graduated? Students, raise hands. A few. And what about the others? Could someone, what do you do? Are you teachers? Uh, do you want to be students? Well, um, in this area, we would say we will always be students learning things. Um, I love open source because I like to be able to get deep into technology without just having the black box. Um, I love martial arts. Um, I li like to play Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I have a lovely daughter who might become an engineer in the future, we never know. Um, and she came to join. The BBC. Who here knows the BBC? Oh, that's much better. OK. Um, I knew BBC based on the news and sometimes on uh, some movies and things they prepare. But actually, before I joined the company, I was not aware of the values of the company. So um, first of all, it is a public organization, but it's not sponsored by the government directly. So it's as if each and every of you would have the choice of paying an additional tax to be able to use the BBC and the other public stations. So we don't have any advertisement within the UK. Um, and the company really aims to be impartial. That's a key value. So let's say, for instance, we're talking about politics. We always try to give the views from different parties. Um, if we're talking about climate change, we do try to give the perspective of people who say it is a thing and some people who might say, well, no, that's not really happening. But then, of course, although we try to give the different views, we also give weights to things. So in the case of climate change, it's something that there is so much evidence that it's really happening. So usually we would, um, of course, give the real evidence and allow people to make their own decisions. Um, and it is a quite diverse organization. And we do have a challenge because as a broadcasting corporation, we have radio and we have TV. And now that people are mostly using computers and we have YouTube, Netflix, and all those things, uh, the BBC is struggling a bit to get uh, reach to the young audiences. So uh, how can we get people who are between 20 and 35 years old 
to engage with the BBC? How can the BBC be useful to those people who are just starting their lives? Um, and this is a part, this is my office. So we have this room which tries to emulate how would be a teenager room. And um, there are some numbers uh, saying that currently the um, teenagers use more, teenage, well, teenagers and young adults between 16 and 24 years old uh, use more uh, Netflix than the BBC. And then also some comparisons about the usage of radio that people are using other services which perhaps can, they feel they can get more out of them. And this is a real struggle. Um, so the company was founded in 1922. Um, it has two objectives, to inform, to educate and entertain in this order. Um, and our aim is to really serve this audience. So we are paid by people to serve them and we want to do this in the best way. Um, so some numbers. In the UK currently, we have 66 million people um, and 91% of the adult population uses BBC in some sense. Worldwide, our news reach uh, 426 million people, considering there are around 7.7 million billion people in the world, that's quite a reach. And just another comparison, so you can have an idea of how big this reach is. Um, in Ukraine, there are around 42 million people. So um, it would mean that everybody in the UK, plus the penguins from Antarctica, there are 12 million penguins in Antarctica, would be watching BBC um, on a weekly basis. You can tag the screen and... No, 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 the screen's not working. It's not connected, no. connected to... No, the screen. Not this time. <laughs> well, okay, but it would be good. Um, so uh, my team within BBC is called Data Lab, and one of our objectives is to bring the data together and make some sense out of it, connecting the multiple departments across the organization, and to allow the audience to have a personalized experience in a way they find it meaningful. Um, this is our team, so you can see there is, uh, given the IT uh, area, I would say we are quite diverse. We have a good mixture of women, of men, people from all over the world, um, and it, it is really interesting how um, the company tries to give value to the individual people and accommodate. So, um, as an example, for me to be here, since I'm a single mother, it was quite tricky with the logistics with my daughter, who's just two years old. So um, I was invited to come to a conference yesterday, um, and they would pay my expenses, but it would be hard for me to afford my daughter's ticket. So what the BBC and my team did, they said, don't worry, we will cover your expenses, the conference can pay for a mother's expenses, my daughter, and then you can fly to the Ukraine and you can still enjoy the conference and get to know people. So um, sometimes I, I know it is hard to see how can we balance family life and work, but there are ways and there are companies which really help and support on this. Um, so in our team we have editorial team members, data scientists, engineers, uh, product manager, project manager, and for some period of time, in one of the projects I'm described, I will be describing, we also had designers and um, we also had mobile developers. So we tend to work with different people in different projects. Um, so where machine learning is used within the BBC? So one of them is to offer content for the audience. So to surface content we will be sharing with the audience such as uh, personalized recommendations of things, very similar to what you see in Netflix or in Amazon, if you use Amazon to buy things online or YouTube or even Twitter. Um, and the other usage is to actually create content. So um, there are links here after you can follow up, but this is a program which was fully 
done with machine learning. So we went through the BBC archives, we run this algorithm and it tried to spot which were good things and it brought the selection of, of things together. And as a result, this went on air. Um, I think it was BBC Three, I've made a mistake, uh, but there is the link there and hopefully you might be able to watch it if you're interested too. Um, so this is the case of a supervised learning algorithm, uh, but this is part of the work we do on a daily basis. So we have historical data where we have interactions of users with the content. Um, we train using uh, some model. So in this case, it's a supervised, but there would be a bit different workflow. It was unsupervised. Uh, we sometimes use content-based recommenders. Sometimes we use um, collaborative filtering or hybrid approaches. Um, as an output of training the model, we have this magic box, which is the machine learning model. Uh, and with this model, we can try to predict the future. Um, so we get the data we want to surface and we tell this model, please, may, what do you think this user will like? And then based on characteristics from the user and the content, we have a list of, okay, for this user, give this. Um, and then I will demo now two projects my team has been involved over the last year, so we can have an idea of how um, it has been. So one of them is an experiment, which is an app, which BBC was willing to try out things. So we had a very fast uh, iteration, development iteration. So I think we launched it in six months time, from beginning to end and we were able to have weekly updates on it and change the UI and uh, to change the backend as often as we wanted. So as soon as we would make a change, we would commit to GitHub and we would quickly have those things deployed live. Um, and the idea with this app was to expose short video clips. So to this point, although the BBC did have video platforms, it did have audio platforms, but it wouldn't surface the short clips things which seem to be uh, quite used in YouTube and other things. So the purpose of this app was, let's get these video clips, the short videos, which are less than five minutes, and let's try to engage the young audience with this, and let's do some experiments around it. So the interface was as most, as YouTube and other applications, you had a landing page where you would have some videos of the day, good morning, um, then you could select topics, life stories or science and so on, you would see things from that topic. This was the personalized initial homepage. Um, then you could select video clips, see related videos to the one you selected, showing um, if you had watched them, some percentage of them, and you could have search, um, and the search were, weren't really personalized, but those were the features we were covering in this app. They just would be to have it uh, personalized with a search as well. Um, this is the part, uh, this is how this, um, how we implemented the backend for this platform. So we used content-based recommendations. So for each video we, BBC has, uh, we have metadata associated. So they are classified relating brands, they have subtitles, they have paragraph describing, um, and they have several information around them. Um, and we create um, a representation of that video. So let's say the age is one, and it has these two genres, and the percentage of relevance of those topics for this specific video is, for instance, 80% and 20%. So this is a simplified view, but it is quite close to what we have. On the other side, we try to represent for the computer what a user is. So we get information from news, from videos, search the user did, and based on this, we create a very similar representation where we would try to specify what are the interests of that user. Um, and then, based on these two things, so we have a machine representation of the content, you have a machine representation of the user, and it's just a matter of bringing those things together. 
So um, in this case, we even used an open source database called Elasticsearch, which is a search engine. Um, you can see uh, recommendations uh, as a search, because in search you're just ranking results. So it's quite similar. And in this case, you would use the user profile with the characteristics of the user to search the database and as an output, you have programs which match that profile. Um, of course, since BBC does have the aims of informing, educating, and blah, 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 we wouldn't be able to just get the, the user profile and recommend only based on that. So it's quite common for people to get into those bubbles where you focus on, uh, let's just watch these huge penguins videos and those things or this funny cats. Um, so we do try to diversify a bit, uh, but this is how this type of algorithm usually works. Um, and then, uh, it is started quite similar to what I showed to you. So we got the user profile, we had all the content profile, we did the match using a database, but then there was more. So embedded with our team in the table next to mine, we have an editorial team member who started to use the app and saying, this is completely unacceptable, or this is okay. Um, and then we had to iterate through those results. So um, some of the concerns, um, BBC had this green book, which you can see the principles through this link. And this is slides I will be sharing, um, but um, it has this massive book with all the editorial principles what the BBC can and cannot do. Uh, and it's not really like, um, let's say, it is not a boring thing. And I find it very novel because it really tries to stick to the principles of the company regarding partiality and so on. So one of the first concerns we had when we got the app launched was our editor team member said, I don't want to go to prison. And then you could say, come on. Why would a BBC editor be worried about going to prison? Um, and uh, the BBC cannot, under any circumstance, influence the jury of trials. So let's say um, someone is being accused of sexual harassment, as is this video. Uh, if the BBC puts this on the front page on the week of the trial, there is a likelihood the jury of that trial will see the BBC and let's say this headline, the guy says, I have not sexually harassed anyone, quotes. So this is more or less a declaration of, yes, I did, and I'm saying I didn't, and this is so relevant, that is my opinion, I didn't, that is highlighted in the title. And then of course, as part of the video, the BBC will be impartial, in the sense it will present the 14 woman who said this guy really harassed them and the guy saying why he thinks that's a misinterpretation of the facts. Um, but uh, there would be a likelihood the jury would be influenced by this content. So this is the type of content we cannot uh, be publishing, recommending directly during a specific time. So over the week before a trial, this is ty the type of thing we need to avoid. Um, and this is one of the things machine learning can help. So we can try to identify, one option would be people who write the content should add tags and labels saying this is uh, a possible contempt of court. Um, but since we don't necessarily have that, machine learning can help trying to identify those cases. And this is, was one of the things we made sure we were not surfacing within the app. Um, then, uh, during elections, again, we cannot just uh, be promoting a specific party opposed to others. Uh, so, we cannot surface political content at all during elections. We will have not the general elections in the UK, so we just need to make sure those things will be off from the personalized recommendations until the day after election. Uh, then, uh, even though uh, there is a huge concern with quality, inside the BBC we do produce content which is not necessarily 
a death wish for the audience. So um, you can see this title, Series 25 Preview, Episodes 26, 38. Imagine if we showed this in the app. That's horrible. So um, people wouldn't know what the show is about, nor anything. So we had to make sure we were removing th this type of thing from the recommendations as well. Um, and then another type of concern. Um, there, there are some of the BBC applications, um, they are for children, for under 16. And we do have content with a strong language with sex and violence. So what can we do? So in the TV, nothing with a strong language, uh, sex or violence can go on air from 9 p.m. But when you have the app and the person is selecting things, how can you try to avoid that? So what we do with the, our products usually is if the person um, in this app, we ended up removing anything because the focus was the younger audiences. Uh, but in iPlayer, which is a sort of BBC Netflix, what we do is if the person is watching children content, we try to avoid the person leaving the children content. So this way, if you had your child using your device, they wouldn't be exposed to some uh, inadequate scenes. Um, then GDPR, which is quite common nowadays, the right uh, that was approved uh, in Europe a few years ago. So the principle is, um, it is our data that is out there. So when we are accessing websites, when we are watching videos, when we are reading news, those things are ours. And when we allow uh, companies such as uh, Facebook and Amazon and so on to use those, to give us recommendations, uh, we give them the power of deciding for us and really taking us wherever they want. Uh, and uh, in, with GDPR, it becomes a right of the audience to decide when you want your content to be forgotten. So if you want to tell Amazon or BBC that, look, Forget everything I bought over the last year. I don't want you to hold this data. You have that right. So we had to have this in the application to make sure users could be forgotten partially or completed, uh, completely. Um, some other things. We want to make sure people know why they're being recommended things when the algorithm allows. So an example, this specific screen, it's being recommended because it relates to arts. That's the topic. So uh, it's because you previously watched something related to arts. Um, what else do we have in a pops here? So uh, many companies, uh, including companies for which I worked before, their concern is Let's keep users in our website. Let's maximize time people are using the website. Let's maximize the number of clicks they do through tweets or through Instagram, or let's just optimize over that. We want to get the person spending two hours a day with us. It's a bit trickier in the BBC because that's not what we want. So we cannot use metrics that are usually common in the market. And these are some of the creation values people have when they are authoring things within the BBC and they build a homepage, manually created. Um, and some of them are not obvious how you can get metrics which we would be able to have with the machine to measure them and automatically evaluate the quality of the recommender. So some of the concerns, uh, how much does the user relate to that content? Uh, how compelling it is? Fresh is quite easy. We have the time, we can see, we can have functions to analyze how far it is from nowadays, um, how aspirational it is. How can we evaluate how aspirational is the content? How entertaining, how reassuring. So what we try to do is much more than just click rates. Um, then, uh, just speaking, um, our values, so education, form, and everything, they are in all levels. These are some of the things we do consider. So we do consider um, a NCCG, which gets um, given a list of recommendations and their position in the list. 
uh, what is the likelihood of a user clicking, and then you have a sort of accuracy based on the list position, uh, hit rate, which is done everywhere, but then diversity, which cannot just recommend if the person just watched movies about some soap opera. We will not be recommending only soap opera. That's something the company is committed to diversify. Recency, surprisal, all those things we try to measure somehow. Um, and we have both online evaluation. So we release a new version of the recommender and we have a sort of A-B test where we see how people are reacting to it over time and we can get numbers and those numbers guide us. But we also have some sort of, before we deploy to production, some evaluations which try to measure how those metrics are and depending if they become lower, we might not deploy a new version of the recommender. Uh, so you can see from the moment we implemented the actual recommender itself, in the search engine we had the profiles of user and content, there is this huge line, all of which built together with editorial teams, which we had to go through. And this is a bit that I believe happens in any job when you start working. Um, there is that piece, so you did your work, it, it seems you finished, but then there is this long path until you can have something which will be actually compliant with what your company expects. Uh, some some takeaways from this experience. Um, editorial partnership was key to our work. Um, the principles of the BBC really affect our decisions. And there is a huge path between having the implementation done. And you can do the implementation in the neatest way everything automated, continuous integration, continuous delivery, it can be in the cloud, you can be able to scale to millions of users, but unless you respect the company's values, you're not there yet. And there is this other quite exciting work we've done, so this is another use case. Um, this is a, an application called BBC Sounds, which is sort of a sort of Spotify, with uh, BBC content where we have both podcasts and music. And we're currently paying an external provider for each. I don't know the values, but it's certainly very expensive. But I think worse than being expensive is, it is just a black box. So the control of BBC on that technology is zero. So my team is helping to replace this. Um, the current thing is content-based, similar to what I described before, um, and it does try to have uh, an ontology, a graph with the concepts, and infer relationships between concepts when it creates the content profile, and then it recommends things. Um, that said, uh, there is some room for improvement in the current content provider, because the content in BBC doesn't have many labels and tags, um, and when you don't have proper annotations, you have two options. Either you use machine learning or something to extract information of the content, or you have poor recommendations. So in this specific product, the current provider is giving really poor recommendations. Um, and we have an issue which is, although we really want to boost users from 16 to 35 years old, this app, most of our users are around 50 years old, and you can get an idea that the content they're using is quite different from the content the young audiences will be using. That adds another factor. And um, when users come to the product for the first time, currently it's still manually created by all editors. So these are some of the challenges we have. And the algorithm we decided to apply is called factorization machines to solve this. Um, so I already described how content-based is for the previous product, I won't repeat. So that's what this company is doing, that's what we did for the previous job, which another uh, common um, machine learning approach is to use collaborative filtering. The idea is, let's get the data that of, of all of you produced, we will be analyzing all your consumption history. Based on your consumption history, we see who is similar to who. And then after that, we say, well, if this person was similar to this one, let's just recommend the videos this one watched and this one didn't. So um, 
That said, uh, there are several algorithms which can allow you to implement collaborative filtering. In the case of S SVM, for instance, um, one of the tricky things is if you have some sparse data, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily give uh, very good estimates and it's quite expensive. Um, another issue is if you were to use uh, this collaborative filtering only, you also can solve uh, code storage. So when it's the first time of a user, you know nothing about them. So you cannot recommend because you don't know who that user is similar to. Uh, so we ended up getting a hybrid uh, algorithm, which does use content similarity, but it also considers uh, the overall users, um, all the users' consumption. So it uses both the content metadata and also all the users' interactions. And since it represents the data as a sparse matrix, all the operations it does, a similarity and matching, they are much cheaper. So it allows to run the predictions in linear time, which is quite good. Better than that, only constant, but I do, I'm not aware of any method which would allow you to recommend things in a linear time. Uh, well, you could always recommend the same thing, but that wouldn't be particularly good. Um, so, whoops. this is just to illustrate. So let's say we have three consumers, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Uh, Alice watched Titanic, Notting Hill, and Star Wars. Bob watched Star Wars and Star Trek. Charlie watched Titanic and Star Wars. Uh, we do have ratings for each of those things, and that matters. Because let's say we want now to predict we want to see how likely Alice would be to watch Star Trek. Someone could say, if we were just using pure collaborative filtering without considering any additional features, someone could say, well, we have this guy who watched, Bob watched both Star Wars and Star Trek, so Alice watched Star Wars, she will like Star Trek. However, if we look at the rating Alice gave to Star Wars, it was quite low. So um, this, we will end up influencing that there is a likelihood she won't be so interested on Star Trek as well. And those are due to the inherent properties of these two things. So we would also have additional information saying, look, this is a sci-fi movie, sort of relates to space. This two are similar, so it is less likely she will be interested on that. Um, to be able to evaluate how good or how bad our algorithm is compared to the current provider, uh, we made a qualitative experiment where we got the current provider and we got nine recommendations um, personalized for a group of users, so we got 30 users. Then we got nine recommendations from our algorithm. We did not name which was which, and we asked people to say, which of these lists you prefer and why? Um, and the idea was just before we actually deployed this live and we had this running to be able to get people uh, talking and seeing and just telling us if we were going in the right direction or not. And as a result, 61 preferred our current algorithm, 28 preferred the old one, and some people didn't like either of them or liked both of them. So this is enforcing us that we are in the right path and we, should, we are in the process of implementing the API. The API we're implementing currently, we need to serve in less than 80 milliseconds for uh, over 1,500 users per second. So that's the speed we need to be surfacing recommendations um, with this level of quality or even higher. And um, in the end, what will really prove the quality of this project, which sh we should be launching in March, is the actual user's consumptions. So imagine that each of these lines is a different recommender. You have some metric, which uh, in some cases is click-through, in others is how much time the person spends, or it could be uh, how many new things a user is watching since we want to educate. And you track the behavior of the multiple recommenders 
and then based on this overtime and with the statistic significance, you decide which recommenders will win by evolution, based on real usage of them. Uh, so some of the principles, there are some links here. Audiences are at the heart. We really want to care about the audience and we want to make them happy. We want to be equally and fairly to distribute the knowledge with people. Um, and uh, we also work directly with human beings who have experienced creating content and will help us. Now, whenever we talk, we care about people, we want to help them. Some people might say, but how do you know what people want? If the 16s to 2035 are not using the BBC, perhaps you guys don't know what people want. And that's a very fair point. Uh, so one of the attempts of the company is to allow people to tell us things. So there was this recent survey, which I found it really amazing, called Flourishing in AI Report, where the focus is on people. So we got 11,000 people from seven, mar seven markets, and those people were asked what they want from their lives, and what do you think technology can help them? Um, and this report is very tiny, very huge. You can download and see yourself. Uh, but some interesting things. So uh, people in the UK don't think technology is being developed for the best interest. And this is quite interesting, because if you get people in China, they have a very optimistic view of technology. And there are lots of explanations for this. It can be a socio-economic period the country is going through. So in China, they are developing, they're growing, they are in this phase where things seem to be flourishing. Uh, whereas UK, we have Brexit and we have a few things dragging us out. Um, so, but all in all, people who think technology is used to manipulate them, or they're just wasting their time because they get stuck into that um, eternal loop and they just, don't get control of their own time. So this is what UK people think. Um, and then um, some questions. How satisfied are you with your life? And then if you see the numbers, people from 16, we have less than 30% of people between 16 and 24 who are actually happy with their lives. It's less than a third. Something does seem wrong. And then over time, it seems this thing improves the bit. there is some some level here probably when people start having children um, but then after perhaps when children get into university and so on people start getting happy again but it's quite interesting to see how happy people are um, question so one of the curves the yellow one is if you feel anxious look how much even if we see people with 65 years old if you say almost 50% of people did feel anxious yesterday, is this really normal? Is this what we want for life? Um, and then the main concerns each age group had, and it's quite interesting to see people struggling with mental health. How should you be able to decide what to do with your life? And how can you be accepted in society? then am I good enough, do I belong to groups, um, I'm stressed, I'm working too much, then uh, oh my body doesn't look very good, I'm too fat or whatever, then you just try struggle to pay all the bills uh, because you might or may not have kids, you can get a job, you can lose the job, you might want to buy a house, and then oh my god, all those things, and then eventually when you're 65 you didn't realize, but there is a concern with the sexual life because then things might not be working as people expect. So um, throughout the age groups, people have different anxieties, different concerns. And if we really want to be useful for them, it's really important to know what are these things so we really can see how we can improve on that. Um, and then in this report, there are lots of things like this, which are key areas technology could help for each of those topics, saying we could see how to help people to make some progress in work. We could help uh, trying to 
um, show what is a fake news, what isn't a fake news, or how likely is a news to be fake, uh, helping people to share the knowledge, uh, helping people being recognized by their peers. Uh, this is just one example, but in this report there are lots of concrete things as uh, content providers or as products we can try to do to help people. Um, and then some shifts that sometimes technology currently is seen this way and is actually used this way and where we could head so the society can feel more encouraged and embrace it more. So to move from being a competitor to a supporter. So we don't need to compete with other companies. Let's look to the audience. What do they need? What can we serve? From a barrier to human interaction to a tool to enhance human in, uh, contact. So do we want a platform where everybody posts how wonderful their lives are? Is that really helping? Or is there a way where we could allow people to be human beings, share their problems and things, and feel encouraged and supported? Um, from being understood by the elite, so from the study, people who do have a higher socioeconomic level are more optimistic towards technology, because perhaps some of them even control it, to be an inside track for all. So let's try to show all this technology can be used from, and can help. So uh, from being this uh, endless information where you can stay two hours or three hours without realizing the time has passed, to see what exactly is useful for that person in that moment, in that place. And that's fine. So we don't need to keep people completely hypnosed. Let's just give what they need. Uh, from being a distraction to helping people to focus. So um, I don't know how many of you saw this app called um, Mindspace. It's not from the BBC, uh, but it helps you meditating. Mm -hmm. And there was a period when I was going through some anxiety and something, and uh, I received this advice, why don't you try this? I said, meditation, but that's so boring. I will sleep or whatsoever, but no. These things really help you having a focus and just getting well. From being a cause to stress to relieve the stress. Um, so those are some of the things. And I do think from a product perspective, our user can decide if they want personalization or not. And based on this, we are recording their data or not, we're giving personalized experience or not. And who should join this are the users. And this is very important to be really explicit. Okay, now that we went through, through this talk, um, since um, I was told that this university does have some radio and things related, um, I thought it would be nice for you guys to see one of our buildings. So usually the I can work from any office in the BBC. Um, and this is one of the offices we can work from. Um, so, um, this is the building from outside, if you go to Oxford Circles in London, you will be able to see it, there is this church, it's some post, not the cathedral, another one, and the station is here, and you can just walk, and here I'm in the fifth floor of this building, um, and we do have on Monday's evenings, some programs are recorded in the ground floor, so anyone can actually watch them. This is an inside view how the building looks like. From an engineering perspective, it's very exciting because there is this massive wall which cuts the building in half in case there is some fire issue. Um, so the fire would remain only on one side of the building. Um, and news are recorded on the ground floor. So this is how one of these buildings look like. And this is a studio uh, where we record the radio programs. Uh, so we have a few of these studios. Um, and I talked to a video producer, who is Jacob, and works on this on his day to day. And he even recorded a video to talk a bit to you guys. Uh, it's a two minutes video, but the idea was to give you the chance of seeing a bit how people who are not necessarily technical how they see BBC and how is their work. So it is really two minutes and then we will be done. So.
This is Jacob. Let me get you this. Hello, Ukraine. I'm Jacob, and hi, Kathy, and thanks for having me. Um, I work at BBC Radio Work, and I wanted to show you our studios. We've got six of these on the eighth floor of our building in central London, and this is where Radio One, Boy Extra, and H Network all broadcast their shows from. And I'm a producer, so my role. Okay, so this is just to show a bit of the other side. Sometimes we are too focused with the engineering and our things. And um, I think it is really hard when you prepare some presentation to decide on a message to share. Um, I think the same way we care about the audiences, we care about the people who work with us and all this mixture uh, helps building uh, what we are and um, if any of you is interested in knowing more about what we're doing uh, what are the problems what we've what we need we are hiring and um, we have eight engineering vacancies and two data scientists and lots of positions and that's just my team so um, and I asked my, my manager, but would we be able to bring people from Ukraine since it's not part of EU? He said, we can bring the right people. So, um, of course, I know from, I've been for a little time in Ukraine, but I've seen you have lots of talents. We don't want to take all of you outside of the Ukraine, but if some of you would like to come, that would be a pleasure. Um, there is a very interesting article uh, that my boss wrote uh, with some practical advice. So even checklists when you're building a product, how you can try to see metrics and things which will guide and make sure you're building something which is ethical. Um, there is a link there, slides will be shared shortly. Um, and then um, I would like to thank you all uh, for coming here on the Sunday and if you have any questions or anything about anything it's truly a pleasure. Why not you 